Praise the Lord. You guys ready to get in the Word this morning? Let's stand to our feet for the reading of God's Word. As you're standing, I want to say also, Happy Father's Day to all the dads and granddads. We honor you here today. It's a, it is a, um, it's a calling of God to be a dad. To be a granddad. Thank God for grace and anointing for us to to do that. To be that. To fulfill that role. Reading today from the, the book of Luke chapter 15. Beginning with verse 11. And Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Never noticed this till just now. I want you to look there. It says, and he divided unto them. Not just that one son that was asking for his portion. It says he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And would he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Let us pray. Father, we pause right now just to look to you to honor you as our Heavenly Father. And I pray, Lord, today that you help us in a greater way to recognize what a good, good Father that you are. Lord, anoint us together as we focus on your word today. Help us to hear your word. Cause it to uh, produce in us, every person here, the purpose for which you brought us together. Lord, we thank you for it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you can be seated. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I just titled this message, Happy Father's Day. The story that I read, the verses that I read to you from the Word of God, I must say, is one of my all-time favorite stories in the Bible that Jesus told. It's been preached many times by a lot of preachers. It's been several times. It's been the text that I've gone from. And over the years, I've preached it from a lot of different angles. Most of the time, we center our comments around the prodigal son as if the... He is that key figure, the wayward son. After all, we know it is called the parable of the prodigal son. 
But sometimes we've preached about that older brother and the fact that he missed the whole point and he was certainly as far out of touch with the heart of the father even as the younger son was. I remember one time, not too long ago, some of you may remember this, I preached about a silent member in this story. There's no reference made to the mother in the story that Jesus told, but I know she was there. Uh, it, there is much evidence that there was a praying, supportive, and submissive mother in that house. But today, we're going to recognize the central figure in this story is really the father. This story is really about the father and how much he loves his family. Now, we might miss that at a glance, but that's if you read and really think about this story, you recognize that. And, you know, for us to get any situation right, we have to discern the place that God has in it. We have to try to figure out what God's heart is in that situation. And this story clearly represents the heart of the Father of God. How many of you know today that we have a good, good father? I hope you know that you are loved by him today. I hope you know today that there's not anything you can do to change the fact that you are loved by God more than anybody could ever love anything. You are lo loved by the Father God. And there's nothing you can do to change that. He loves us when we obey Him with all of our hearts. And He loves us when we rebel against Him and run as far away from Him as we can get. He loves us. He loves us when we honor Him with our lives. He loves us when we dishonor Him. He loves us when we seek Him to follow Him. He loves us when we refuse to hear Him, when we turn a deaf ear to Him, when we run, insist on running our own way. He still loves us. How many of you know today that God is for you and not against you? Hallelujah. You can always count on that. The camp meeting speaker had a phrase that she said often this week. You can take that to the bank. The Father God is always for you and never against you. Listen to this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. It's, he said, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Oh, if some of y'all just knew what the Father thinks about you. I guarantee you it ain't what you think he's thinking most of the time. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Rest assured, God is always, you are always on his mind. I heard Randy say something about that earlier. He made an investment. He bankrupt heaven for you. And you're always on his mind. His thoughts are always good toward you. He wants the very, very best 
for you always. Listen to it in a different translation. He says, for I know the plans. Now, talking about thoughts, his thoughts aren't just thoughts, but they're plans. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I wonder how many here today have plans for your life. Well, I hope you do. Somebody said if you aim for nothing, you're sure to hit it. So I hope you got plans for your life. I wonder if you have come to the place that you are willing to recognize and more than recognize, but accept and embrace the fact that God has the best plan for your life. There is a God plan for you, you know. Before you were here, God had, he, he, he made that plan and you were created to fit that plan to a T. So we could say it like this. There's such thing as plans, but then there is the master plan. Oh, we're so wise. We are so very wise if we set out and purpose that we will find out what the master plan for our lives is and to walk in harmony with it. I want you to imagine this family that our text is about. Here is the father with his wife and two boys. I want you to think about the potential that is there. Now I want you to recognize something. Your life, your family has great potential. You're liable to hear a few daddy quotes today, if that's all right, as I go along. I mean, my dad used to say to me, son, you want to grow up to amount to something. And every once in a while, if I was just being particularly rebellious and out there, he would say, son, why don't you straighten up and act like somebody? How many of you know that God intends for your life to amount to something, to have impact in the world that we live in? I don't think enough Christians really recognize that God created us to be people of impact. He, he called us salt and light. When you think about that, both of those uh, uh, produce great change when they come into contact with something else. But I want you to think about this father from the time his sons come into the world. The, the, the story that we read, he was focused on their success. He was sowing everything he had into them and to their success. Like every parent, his desire was to share everything in his heart and everything he could provide to save them as much pain as he possibly could and to ensure their success. How many of you know that there's a whole lot to be learned from people that genuinely love you? Isn't it something how we take so many of our lessons from people that don't give a hoot about us? We tend, to, we tend to embrace and take in and swallow up and apply so many things that comes from people that really have 
ulterior motives to begin with. But what about the people that have demonstrated to us that they truly, truly love us and their heart is always with us? Wonder what it is about young folks. Now, I'm not beating on any young folks. I, I was one one time. But wonder what it is about young folks that makes them think that they already know more than us seasoned people do and that us old guys just don't know anything. Well, you're just so out of touch. Man, you, you can't even relate. They, that, that's kind of what comes across sometimes. I don't know how many times I heard my daddy say this. After I had gone off on one of my bright tangents and it had backfired and I had come crawling back and I had to ask him for some help He'd say, son, you'll always come out better if you listen to your poor old gray-haired daddy. Now, he said it just like that, with the emphasis just like I put it. Son, you'll always come out better. If you'll listen to your poor old gray-haired daddy. He was right. You know what? The older I get, the smarter he was. Man, he, he, man. And Sheila said this to me one time, and when she first said it, I, I didn't know I'm not sure about the context. She, it might have been going on right then, but she said, you've become Hubert. <laughs> but I've come to realize that I have become my daddy because I find myself harping some of the same tunes that he often harped to me. And they're still right. I mean, here on the front row, I just want you to know they're still right. <laughs> the smart thing would have been for this young boy that we read about here, this prodigal, and for a lot of other of us young boys would have been to sit down with his dad at every opportunity and say something like this, Dad, I need your advice. I know you've been fur you're further down the road than I have, and would you, would you, could you take just a little time and share your wisdom and some of your experience with me so that I can avoid some of the pitfalls that lie ahead of me and make the most of how you have set me up. This dad was setting his sons up. Just like our Heavenly Father has set us up for success. Amen. He wants the best for us. But this story shows us Something, again, a lot of us can relate to it. Some wasted years by that young man. You ever wondered why it is that we have to find out some, we have to learn some lessons the hard way? Why is it? it we just have to learn some things the hard way. Listen. If you're going to, if you're not going to be smart, you better be tough. Some people insist. Some people insist on repeating grade. You know, I'm talking like this is old school stuff here. If you fail, you repeat the grade. You have to take the 
You have to take the lesson over. You have to take the test over. Some people insist on repeating grade after grade in the school of hard knocks. And then other of us, you know, we got the diploma hanging on the wall. We graduated from the school of hard knocks. Some of us can say, I've been there, I've done that, I got the t-shirt. This young man in this story had his mind made up. He had his heart set. He was going his own way. What is it about us that, what is it inside of us that makes us that way? I know you all think that I could not possibly remember that far back, but I do remember as a teenager some of the things that my mom and dad were drilling into me and expecting of me, and I was very sure of where the boundaries were, but I remember coming to a place that I just thought, well, that's their life. That's their way. They're happy with that, but this is my life. I'm going to do this my way, and they'll just have to get used to it. They'll just have, no, here's one that we hear, that we hear a whole lot today. They'll just have to accept it. Like it or lump it. Here's what I'm going to do. This young man, he had a bad case of that that we read about. He was going his own way. And nobody was going to deprive him of it. If you're set on doing that here today, if that's your mindset, I got to tell you something. It ain't worth it. It absolutely is not worth it. I got to tell you something. If your mindset is that way like this young boy's was, if you, if you refuse to see how good your Heavenly Father is and how He's setting you up for success and how He's got a better plan for you than you could possibly come up on your own and you're intent on going your own way, I got to tell you, if you go that way, there'll come a day when you will regret. You will regret it. I know I've been there. I've done that. I got the T-shirt. But the thing I want you to see this morning is the Father's heart at this time. It never changed. He could have said, why, well, you little disrespectful squirt. After all I've done for you and the potential that I have Handed to you on a platter? As good as I've been to you and you want to disrespect me that way? Father's heart never changed at all. Just like when people insist on going their own way regardless of how old they are. Ignoring the will of the Father God. Spurning His love for them. His heart never changes. His heart never changes. That was still his boy. See, if you, want to, if you want to live out from under the Father's covering, he'll let you. It breaks his heart, but he will honor your decision. If you wind up in hell... It won't be because God disowned you, but because you disowned Him. If you wind up in hell, if you miss God's best in this life and the one to come, it won't be because He turned His back on you. It'll be because you turned your back on Him. He will never walk away from you. He will never give up on His plan for you. He is always willing to invest in His plan for you.
that young man stepped out of the will of God. He stepped out from under the protective covering and the blessing of the Father, and he walked into a world where he was open game and where he was vulnerable to the ambush of the devil, who as a roaring lion was out there seeking whom he may devour. I must tell you today, that roaring lion is still out there seeking whom he may devour. And if you're out from under the covering of God's will for your life, you're open game to that devil. Again, I want you to see the Father's heart. I believe that day by day, as this son was away, out of sight, the Father grieved over that distant son. I believe he prayed that that son would see the light and realize what he had forfeited by his rebellion. I believe that father was probably saying something like, God, whatever it takes, get his attention and bring him home. I believe that that daddy made it a practice you know, we read it in this story about the day that it happened, but I believe it was probably every day that daddy went out there and he looked down the road just as far as he could see. And his faith, in, in faith, he was seeing that son coming up that road. And I believe every day as he prayed and believed God, he was dreaming and anticipating the reunion that they would have when he got home. Perhaps he was already setting aside the things for the celebration. And you know how it is when something's on your mind and on your heart, you sort of think about it. And, and if it's something you really love, it's kind of always running in the background of your mind. And you'll be doing something else and all of a sudden you'll say, Oh, you know, it's kind of like me preparing a sermon. I get it early in the week and, and at first it's just real short. And throughout the week, I think, oh, oh, that fits. I got to put that in there. Oh, it just adds to that. That daddy was looking down and he was saying, oh, uh, I, need to, I need to make sure we got a good robe for my son when he comes home. I need to make sure the ring that identifies him as my son and an heir to everything I got. I got to make sure that that ring, the set is, is polished in it and everything is right. And uh, I got to make sure there's a calf being put up back here, being fattened because when he comes, we're going to have a celebration. That young man was out there He was holding out as long as he could hold out. You know, sometimes it's hard for people to come home. They know they need to. Something down inside of them wants to. They just can't bring themselves to saying, I need to go home. This prodigal reached the lowest and the most desperate point of his life. I said he reached the lowest point of his life. I don't know if you've ever been there or not. Again, I have. Maybe you can remember when you reached such a low point. You knew your only hope was in God. But this young man reached the lowest and the most desperate point of his life. And at that point, he had a revelation of hope. While he was in the hog pen, smelly and dirty and hungry and lacking, every fruit of the expression of the pure love of the Father came rushing home to him. And it became very clear to him what he needed to do. Another one of my favorite verses in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says this. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. 
the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I wonder who here today is happy that something in the middle of your worst experience of life drew you back to God. Amen? There was something that convinced you that He was your only hope. There was something that caused you to believe that if you would just call on His name, He would not turn you away. You knew you didn't deserve it, but you were convinced of His unending mercy and grace. It said right here in the lowest point of his life, in the hog pen, he came to himself. All of a sudden, the will of God for him became something he could relate to. All of a sudden, the love of God for him became something that he could relate to. I don't know about you, but I've been there. And he said, I can't stay here another day. I got to go home to my father. I cannot continue this distance from God. This insistent on my own way. Look where it's gotten me. I I got to go home to the Father. Church, I, I remember the weekend that happened in my life. I'll never forget it. I knew I I knew I knew that Sunday morning I had to be in church. I knew that Sunday morning when the altar call was given, I didn't care who was there and who wasn't there, I knew I was gonna hit the altar and cry out to God. I went to church that Sunday morning. The man preached. I didn't think he's ever going to get done. He didn't even preach about salvation, but he opened up the altar. He said, if there's anybody here, anybody here that's not saved, anybody here that, that wants to be saved today, come to this altar and give your life to Christ. I made a beeline to that altar because I knew I knew that was my hope. (laughs) Even though he had an idea, he was still underestimating the love of the Father, though. He said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back. I'm just going, if I can just get back in such a place that I'm just as good as the servants at my dad's house, I'll be all right. He said, I I don't know if dad will have me or not, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. I know how bad I blew that. I'm not worthy to be your son. Will you just let me come and be a servant? Will you let me stay down there in the servants' quarters? Will you let me eat what they eat? Will you you let me go to the field? At least if I go to the field work for you, when I come in, I, I got a place, clean place to lay my head and I got some decent food to eat. He was still, you know what? Maybe some of you are still underestimating what it would mean if you really, really came home to the Father's heart. If you really let God do in you what He created you to do, His plan. If you really am, you're probably still thinking, you know, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. I'm going to have to do this, I'm going to have to do that. The father saw him coming. And as soon as he started his little speech that he had rehearsed over and over, can you imagine how many times he probably, uh, on the way back, he was rehearsing and trying to figure out what he ought to say first and how, he ought, how convincing he could be. And he started that little thing, Daddy, uh, you know, I'm not worthy to be your son. And the daddy cut him off. And he said, he, he called one of his, hey, servant, he called one of his servants, come here. I want you to go, 
get that robe that I set aside. The best, not just any robe. I want you to get the best robe that's in there and bring it here and put it on my son. I want you to get that ring that it was like a it was like a uh, American Express card. Man, when 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 that boy went somewhere and showed that ring or put it in whatever that seal, they knew that daddy was good for it. He he was covered. Go down there to the stall and get that calf we've had put up and tell everybody to get the party ready. We're going to rejoice. How many of you know today that there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents? There was a, you talk about a celebration. You talk about a happy Father's Day. That's what we're looking at right here. We're talking about celebration and restoration. I'm out of time, but I'm going to tell you, I got to tell you one quick thing, and then I'm going to, we'll be done today. I have always thought that this story was about me. It was about me. I mean, I could see myself in every verse of this text you see y'all don't laugh when I say this but my folks called me a miracle baby my parents had a daughter several years before I was in the world and she died at age 12 with polio But when my sister was born, my mom, now she's 103 now, and you know, she got pretty good health. But when I was growing up, mama was puny. I I mean, she turned a corner somewhere along the line and got strong. But back in those days, the doctor said, you can't have any more children. And her tubes were tied when Joanne was born. Twelve years later, Joanne died. There was not a child in my parents' house. Without any medical procedure, miraculously, somehow, here I came. They called me the miracle baby. I had a sense as a child that there was a call of God on my life. It's one of those times where, you know, I don't know if it, I would say it was prophesied over me, but people bore witness with the fact that there was a call of God on my life. I knew I was supposed to be a minister. But there's something about that that just seemed like it cramped me. Hey, my folks, stout holiness people. I mean, strong holiness people. You know, in my day, if you was going to be a Christian, you didn't smoke, you didn't drink. A lot of places you didn't go to because that's what the world did. Uh, That... That story about Samson and the Nazarite vow, that pretty much applied, you know. I mean, that's the way that's the way the church I grew up in lived, and I still believe it's right, by the way. I believe God called us to some clean living. We're supposed to be different from the world. That's a different story. I better stay with my story. When I got to be about 13 years old. I was allowed to do some things like go camping with the boys in the summer. Oh, we did all kinds of things. My parents thought we was camping. We we was into all kinds of stuff. We'd ride bicycles all the way from 
Piedmont to Shawsville to sit down on the curb and drink a pop out of the machine at the service station and then ride them all the way back. My parents would have had a fit. Halfway there, there was a little country store. You know what? We'd stop and all of us would buy a big old King Edward cigar. We're riding down the road in the pitch black dark, puffing them cigars. You see them big old, the end of them, how they light up red, you know? They got to be a little distance between me and my cousin one time, and I don't know who was in front, but whoever was turned around to see what was holding up the other one, and we ran head on. The sparks went everywhere. We wiped out in the road. It was on one of them campouts that I had my first taste of anything alcoholic. I forced, I forced down three beers at night. Every sip I thought I was going to gag my shoes. I hated the taste of it, but I forced it down because, man, it, this is what you got to do to do something exciting, you know? I got me a little job after school. Every, every day after school, I would go to the service station and pump gas from 3.30 till 10 o'clock at night. My folks let me do that. And they thought I was just had a good, you know, I just picked up on a good work ethic. Man, I was being smart. I was making me some money. They didn't know what I was doing every time because I would even stay over the weekend there sometime, all weekend long. And I won't call any names, but there was some people that come in there. They would go and buy us alcohol, and we'd spend the night in the back room of the service station and party all night. 13 and 14 years old. I can't tell you how many times the devil tried to kill me in car wrecks. I don't know how many car wrecks I've been in. Honestly, I don't. But I will tell you this. Every car wreck I've ever been in except one, there was alcohol involved. You catch me when I'm fresh shaven, I can show you some scars where I went almost all the way through a windshield one night. Nobody wore seat belts back in them days. But God had mercy. But there came a point when I was about 18 years old after I had continued to follow that road I really didn't intend to tell y'all all this. When I started down that way, I said, well, I like to drink, but I'll never do any drugs. I'll never, I'll never fool with that. About the last year before I turned my life over to God, I backed up on that. Started fooling with some of that. Drugs and alcohol, get all that together and that can really make it, um, that can really mess you up. I reached a point where I got scared. Now I didn't let nobody know it. But I knew that my life was so far out of control. I was so vulnerable to anything the devil wanted to do in my life. And I knew that I was not in a position to really pray. But in my desperation, one weekend, I was supposed to go back to college. A fellow that my cousin that we, we shared an apartment. We were going to leave on Sunday morning to go back. I, was, I had no intention of going to church that Sunday. But I was trying to get my stuff in a suitcase. I was trying to get my stuff back to go in the car. You know what? I couldn't function. You know that story about Saul of Tarsus where he got struck off of the horse? I can relate to that one too. I wasn't blind. Physically, but I'll take it function.
I was so out of whack. I said, I picked up the phone and I called my cousin. I said, hey man, I'm not leaving this morning. We'll go this afternoon. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to church this morning. I'm going to church this morning. I got to have some help. I am going to church. Hung up the phone. I went to church. And I'm going to tell you what, when that altar call was given and I hit that altar and them, them old saints in the community, some of which I had been very critical of, there was one guy in that church that I was just mad at. I didn't have any, the real true reason to be mad at him. I had wrecked the car in front of his house and he had called, he had called it in. He had called 911 because it looked bad. And the law came. And I was angry at him because he called 911. He was trying to save my life. He was one of them that came. Encouraging me. Praying over me. Telling me that how to go about calling on God and how to be saved. I'm telling you, God saved this boy that day. And he restored his plan for my life. Wasted years. This guy wasted, this guy we read about today, he wasted some time. But the Father restored it. I'm going to tell you what, I wasted some years. Oh, I got to tell you just one more piece. I'm sorry. I know I, know I said I was quitting. I got to tell you one more piece of this. I worried my mom and dad to death. I was such a rebel. I'd come in at night all messed up way in the middle of the night thinking I could slip in and they wouldn't know. They'd be waiting up praying for me. I'd ease that old door open. About the time I'd step one foot in, the lights would come on. I like to worry them to death. But you know what? I'm thankful for this. The last five years of my daddy's life before he passed away, he got to see his son being a pastor. As a matter of fact, I got to... Be I got to be my dad's pastor. Now... In them days, I might have not have preached the best sermons. Might not preach the best ones today. But in those days, regardless of how bad I flubbed, when we'd walk out that door, <laughs> I'd get a hug or an embrace from my dad. He'd say, you done good, son. I'm proud of you, son. I'm telling you, our God is a God of restoration. And he said, if you've wasted, if you've wasted opportunities in your life, if you've gone your plan instead of his, if you'll just come home, he's going to restore. He is a restoration God, I'm telling you. He'll restore what the, what the canker worm and the palmer worm has chewed up and destroyed. He'll restore it. Y'all going to have to stand up so I can find a place to quit. Bow your heads with me today, please. Father, we stand right here before you today so grateful that you are a good, good Father. 
Thankful today, Lord, that you have thought good thoughts toward us. You have perfect plans concerning us, God. You love us, Lord, with a, an unending love. Your mercy is brand new every morning. Lord, we're thankful on this Father's Day that we have a heavenly Father like you. Lord, I know that you've ordained us to be people of great potential. And I pray that you help us, Lord, to recognize that and to yield ourselves to you so that the full potential of our lives can be realized and this world can benefit from the investment that you've made in us. And Lord, today, if there are people in this service, either present or online, that have wasted some years and wasted some time on their own plan, Maybe they feel like they have forfeited your plan, but God, I know today your word is going forth and your spirit is moving and you are convincing people that your heart for them has always been the same and it always will be. Lord, you are ready to celebrate every prodigal that will come home every person that will surrender completely to you. Father, help those that most need to make the decision that the prodigal did to come home. Help them to come home today in the name of Jesus. While heads are bowed, eyes are closed. It's possible that you're here today and you think this message was describing you. You, you. you wonder how it happened. You marvel how it happened. You got to know it's the Spirit of God that has witnessed to you that this is your time. You are here for this purpose today to get your life back on track with the will of God. If you're, if you're outside of the will of God, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to ask you today, I want to encourage you today to take a simple step of calling out to the Father God. He said, if you'll call on His name, if you will call upon His name, you will be saved. He said, if you'll repent, all that means is making a turn, a complete turn, away from the direction and the mindset that you've had. And you're turning unto Him with all of your heart. If you'll repent, if you'll confess your sins, He will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In a minute, we're going to pray that prayer. We're going to pray the sinner's prayer this morning. I'm going to lead in it. We're going to make it. We're going to help you all that we can. God has you set up this morning for the simplest and the easiest way for you to get it right with God. We're going to walk it through together. All of us are going to pray the prayer, but you know who you are. You know if God's dealing with your heart personally. And today when we pray that prayer, if you know you need to pray it, and you will pray it, right where you are, would you slip your hand up? That's simply identifying and say, Preacher, I need to pray this prayer, and I'm going to pray it with you today.
you're watching online today, the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart. He's read your mail this morning. And he's saying, you need to do this, and you need to be serious about doing it. This is an opportunity that you have to do this. It may be the last opportunity. It may be the only opportunity that you have to do it. None of us are guaranteed the rest of this day. But you have now. You have this moment. I want to say this further, too, before we pray. If you've prayed this prayer before, but you've kind of just been kind of sort of living for God, still giving more attention to your plan than His, right now when we pray, I want you to say, God, I'm sorry. Sorry for chasing my plan. I want to seek first the kingdom. Will you do that with me? Let's pray. The sinner's prayer. Everyone that will, pray it aloud with me, please. Heavenly Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name. I thank you for always loving me. Regardless, you love me. Thank you for convincing me of that today. I'm sorry for going my own way. I'm sorry for my sins. I ask you, Lord, forgive my sins. Come into my heart today. Be my Savior and my Lord. From this day forward, help me to know and follow your plan and to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You prayed that prayer in a minute. I want you to know God meant what he said about you.